Welcome to Being There, Slow Art at the Modern. In this presentation, we'll be taking a look at the work of John Chamberlain, with special attention paid to the modern's Skull's Angel from 1974. This is John Chamberlain, often called the Ernest Hemingway of the art world. Indiana saloon keeper's son, World War II Navy vet, one-time Chicago hairdresser, drinker, brawler, poet, and the artist who redefined the medium of sculpture. In his classic 1980 New Yorker profile of Leo Castelli, Calvin Tompkins states that Castelli dealt with the gallery's inner circle members, Rauschenberg, Johns, and Stella, while his aide, Ivan Karp, watched over the rougher and hairier artists. Only one name is mentioned in this second category, John Chamberlain. Another dealer, Alan Stone, once described Chamberlain as looking more like a North Woodsman than a sculptor. Although he worked with a variety of other materials, Chamberlain will always be remembered as the guy who made sculptures using compressed automobile body parts. However, he often said, my work has nothing to do with car wrecks. Born in 1927 in Indiana, his parents divorced when he was four years old and Chamberlain went to live with his grandmother in Chicago. He lied about his age and joined the Navy at 16. And following the Navy, he returned to Chicago to study hairdressing on the GI Bill. He said he became a hairdresser in order to meet women. But it turns out he was very good as a hairdresser. When Vogue magazine featured a new hairstyle, Chamberlain could easily figure out how to do it. And he had exceptional talent for constructing the cantilevered bouffant hairstyles for women that were in fashion at the time. In a 1982 interview with the modern's former chief curator, Michael Opping, Chamberlain explained that the fundamental act of making sculpture is the act of compression. You need to find the material that offers you just the right resistance. At one time, hair offered me the right resistance. I think I probably learned about resistance when I was cutting hair. I still cut some of my friend's hair. We're reminded of Mark Bradford, whose art was also influenced by his experiences working with hair in his mother's salon. When we look at one of Chamberlain's foam sculptures, do we see any evidence of the bouffant? According to Professor David Getze, Chamberlain's focus on volume and color stem from his experiences as a hairdresser, where he learned how to achieve a great amount of volume without a great amount of mass. After spending a little time at the Art Institute of Chicago Museum School and at the University of Illinois, Chamberlain finally found his way to Black Mountain College in North Carolina, where he studied from 1955 to 1956. Motherwell, Rauschenberg, Twombly, and Franz Klein had already left the college by the time Chamberlain arrived. But the poets, Charles Owen, Robert Creeley, and Robert Duncan were still there. And Chamberlain has said that the greatest influence on my work and on my thinking actually came from the poets at Black Mountain College. He said they instilled in him an approach to language that favored the visual appearance and sounds of words dissociating them from their definitions. Chamberlain would often ask his assistants to collect miscellaneous words and put them together haphazardly until something sounded good. I have a room full of parts, said Chamberlain. They are like a lot of words, and I have to take one piece and put it next to another and find out if it really fits. The poet's influence is there. Plus, in my titles. Here are some of Chamberlain's sculpture's titles. The Hot Lady from Bristol, Toasted Hitlers, Miss Lucy Pink, Famous Sackerson, 
felonious orchid, ram fiesled shigers, and flywheel sonata. By 1957, Chamberlain had moved to New York and went to stay at the Long Island home of Larry Rivers. Rivers had an old 1929 Ford on his property, and thinking it was a junker, Chamberlain helped himself to the fenders and drove over them with a truck, compressing the metal. He joined the crushed and twisted fenders together through a process of trial and errors. The pieces themselves suggested the fit, and he produced Shortstop in 1957. Chamberlain had discovered that auto parts could be used to make sculpture, and throughout his career, he constantly searched for the right fit and rearranged his compositions until they locked into place. In essence, Chamberlain was an assemblage artist producing 3D collages from found materials. He showed a new generation that sculpture could be made out of anything. And in the late 1960s, minimalist sculptors like Carl Andre, Dan Flavin, Donald Judd, and Richard Serra began to work with industrial materials, sheet metal, fluorescent light tubes, extruded aluminum, and steel. While in New York, Chamberlain became a regular at the famous Cedar Tavern, where he met artists such as Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko, and Franz Klein. He later said that Franz Klein gave me the structure, citing the sense of force and velocity in Klein's images, and de Kooning gave me the color. We should remember that in the late 40s and in the 50s, sculptures had no added color, and according to Donald Judd, Chamberlain was the first sculptor to really use color. He used car parts because they were available. They already had a coat of paint, and some of them were already formed. Referring to his use of car parts, Chamberlain once said, Michelangelo had a lot of marble in his backyard, so to speak. I had a lot of this stuff. Chamberlain was a, a heavy drinker and earned a reputation for rowdiness at Max's Kansas City, the Cedar Tavern successor. At Max's, he would often amuse his friends by making miniature sculptures by folding cigarette boxes and presenting them as gifts. Donald Judd prized his collection of Chamberlain's miniature cigarette box sculptures. However, by 1965, Chamberlain grew weary of critics' discussions of his choice of car parts, and he began to use other materials. Instead of car parts, he used unpainted galvanized steel, which he had fabricated at the enlarged dimensions of a cigarette box and then crushed. In the summer of 1966, he began squeezing and tying urethane foam. He also made sculptures of resin-coated paper bags using a technique which he called articulate wadding and sculptures of melted plexiglass. But by 1972, Chamberlain had returned to using car metal for his sculptures. In finding your place in sculpture, he said, you need to find the material that offers you just the right resistance. For me, car metal fits the bill. In fact, between 1972 and 1975, Chamberlain made 10 sculptures known as the Texas pieces in painted and chromium plated steel on collector Stanley Marsh's ranch near Amarillo. They are part of the Chinati Foundation collection and are installed in the former wool and mohair building in the center of Marfa, Texas. Donald Judd architecturally adapted the building and Chamberlain and Judd installed the sculptures. Well, here is Skull's Angel from 1974. In this vibrant and dynamic piece and in many of his other sculptures, 
Chamberlain is exploring the interplay of color, sheen, weight, and balance. Through the often violent process of shaping, whether in a car wreck or through compression by the artist himself, the qualities of the material become evident and acquire an individuality, according to Chamberlain, always subject to chance. In Skull's Angel, he has fit pieces together without preliminary planning or intermediates such as drawings or maquettes. Chamberlain has attached the pieces using tack welds and the welding was executed speedily and with little concern for neatness and technical accuracy. Although some of Chamberlain's sculptures have titles that have little to do with the sculpture itself, he just liked the sounds of the words, this is not the case with Skull's Angel. Robert and Ethel Skull were called the mom and pop of pop art and were major players in the New York social scene in the 1960s. When Ethel's father retired, he gave Robert part of his taxi company. And when it became very successful, Robert and Ethel used their money to buy contemporary art, including abstract expressionism and the emerging pop art. They befriended artists, supported their careers, and often bought works straight from their studios. They often socialized with the artists, and sometimes Robert would drink with the artists and provide one of his taxis, which came to be known as Skull's Angels, to drive the artists home. And of course, a patron and supporter of the arts is often called an angel. So when we look at the sculpture once again, we notice that the yellow color reminds us of the color of New York taxicabs. The piece seems to use portions of a wrecked taxicab, but Chamberlain has assembled the metal into graceful folds and curves reminiscent of high Baroque and has created a sculpture with dynamic energy and an odd beauty. In a 1987 conversation, Chamberlain told Michael Opping, the modern's former chief curator, that Skull was a relentless bargainer, expecting favors in the form of lower prices for art in exchange for his help. According to Opping, the fact that Skull's angel appears to be made of parts of a smashed and deformed taxi fender may be an ironic comment on the artist's twisted relationship with the collector. In Skull's Angel, Chamberlain uses found objects and the assemblage technique, repurposing and modifying automobile parts to make his sculpture and letting the material find its own form. This has resulted in some seeing his work as paying homage to the legacy of Marcel Duchamp and some seeing a link with the minimalist's use of pre-manufactured objects. We know that fit Resistance, compression, shaping, or welding, or wadding are important concepts for Chamberlain. His choices of automobile parts, his manipulation of the materials, and his emphasis on discovered correlations rather than a prescribed idea of composition have prompted many to see his sculptures as examples of three-dimensional abstract expressionism. We can certainly sense the gestures and energy of the action painters in Skull's Angel. However, Chamberlain is using car parts. According to Jackson Arne, in a 2019 Artsy article entitled The Staying Power of John Chamberlain's Crushed Car Sculptures, Chamberlain came along at a time when automobile worship was transitioning from a cult to a full-fledged religion. In the early 1960s, he says, cars seemed to represent the best America had to offer, freedom, wealth, and cutting edge technology. Chamberlain sculptures, he continues, seem to sum up everything that's ever been said about the car, ranging from the utopian to the nightmarish. Chamberlain's 2011 New York Times obituary called his sculptures dark commentaries on the costs of American freedom. And Art Forum described his works 
as sensual and erotic and marked by an irrepressible ebullience. According to Michael Opping, Chamberlain's use of automobile parts relates directly to the consumer imagery of pop art. Opping suggests that by 1970, Chamberlain's art reflected a conscious synthesis of two critical movements in American art, abstract expressionism and pop art, and that Skull's Angel is a mature example of this blending. It is clear that John Chamberlain challenged the traditional ideas of media and composition, as we see in Skull's Angel. In so doing, he pushed the boundaries and redefined the medium of sculpture. Chamberlain has said, I think of my art materials not as junk, but as garbage. Manure, actually. It goes from being the waste material of one being to the life source of another. Thank you for spending some time getting to know John Chamberlain's work, and specifically Skull's Angel a bit better. We look forward to seeing you in the museum soon.